Romans tonight. Romans chapter number 8. I want to read you an email for you that I just got. I thought this was quite remarkable. Romans chapter number 8. Romans 8. open here. Verse 1, here we are. Romans 8, 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. Father, I pray that you'd anoint the word, this messenger tonight. In thy holy name, amen. You can be seated. It'll just take me a minute to read this, but it's, you know, we get a lot of emails, and this one has uh, quite a message in it for somebody. So, dear Pastor Lawson, just wanted to let you know how grateful I am for your ministry. I have been watching for about two years now, and it's opened my eyes to so much. I was an atheist until September 2015. I grew up loving science and math, which made it very easy for me to be brainwashed by the New Age teachings. Thank God my wife and sons are Christians and prayed for me to change. I was doing everything the average daddy would do, but I didn't have the Holy Spirit in me and became horribly depressed. I didn't know why I felt this way. I went through each day searching for something I knew and my heart was missing. But no matter what I did, I still felt empty. At what felt to me like the end of my rope to me, I found myself on YouTube late one night watching videos about aliens and such. Until I saw a video about creation by Kent Hovine, the Garden of Eden seminar. I spent the next three hours glued to the screen as I heard him explain the biblical creation story. It went against everything I had ever been taught. But by the end of that video, I was certain that what he was saying was the truth. Now watch the stages of how this changes. It was about 4 a.m. by this time, so I went to bed. I lay there for a little while thinking about all that I'd heard and began to call out to God with an honest desire to know him. Remember that. I began to cry, realizing how much of my life had passed without me knowing him personally. I'm 42 now. At that moment, I could actually feel the Holy Spirit come into me as I lay there. I was overwhelmed by a sense of peace washing over me and knew from that moment on everything would be fine and all the worries in my life melted away. I fell asleep, and when I woke up, I no longer had the feeling that something was missing. I knew that something very profound had happened to me, and I couldn't think of anything but learning more about God. I began watching videos on the internet and reading the Bible and praying. My wife and son immediately knew something had changed in me, and as a result, we became closer than I ever thought we could. Today, we are completely open and honest with each other and work our problems out together as a family. We all pray multiple times a day, thanking the Lord and asking for his guidance. Other people in my life have also noticed the difference. I was not a very good person before and had friends with less than legal lifestyles. One such friend was going through his second divorce at age 32 and fell into using meth. In less than a year, he'd lost everything he owned. His first wife quit letting him see his son, and he was facing 20 years in prison. He stopped by my house one day and told me he'd escaped and was on the run. He was so sleep deprived from the drug, he had begun to see what he called shadows and began to show me pictures on his cell phone that he'd taken of these things. I dismissed the first couple but quickly realized he was showing me pictures of demons. I know it sounds crazy to say he had pictures, but it's true. The hair on my neck stood on end, and my reaction scared him even more. He thought it might be law enforcement with some high-tech camouflage. 
I asked him if he had ever thought about it being something spiritual, and he realized what it was. We talked for a few minutes, and I showed him some of your sermons about the subject. I told him he needed to give his life to God and turn himself in and get help. He left that night. We prayed daily for him. Five days later, he took my advice and turned himself in and was put into a Christian rehab facility for nine months. During that time, he was turned. During that time, he has turned his life around, got saved, found a good Christian woman, and managed to stay clean, even when he had had the opportunity to relapse a couple of times. He graduated from the program January the 26, 2019. That has the ring of truth. He says in this email to me, he says, I'm writing you this because of what you have said in your preaching about a profound change that takes place. And he says, I think you might understand what's happened to me. That's what he said. Yeah, I think that's what he said. The sad thing is that he wrote it to me and we have the, the internet is full of reverence. The churches are full of reverence all over this country and all over the world. And they're not saved. They don't have a clue what this man's talking about. But I know exactly what he's talking about. I know what it is to have the Holy Ghost move into your soul. You feel something, folks. You're going to feel a lightness. You're going to feel clean. You're going to feel power rising up inside your soul. It's greater than you. You're going to feel a love for God. You're going to feel drawn to him. You're going to love his word, love prayer, love spiritual things that you never loved before. You're going to see these changes in your life, and you're going to say to yourself one day, I didn't do this. God did this, and he did. This is not something that wears off and gets old, and all of a sudden you deny it and renounce Christ, walk out the door. No, if you ever knew him, you're not going to do that. Amen. The problem is that people today have been pumped up with feel-good, emotional religion. It comes in all kinds of forms, shapes, and sizes. It depends on the culture. But the bottom line is that they've never met Christ. That's so sad. But I'm thankful for this tonight because it may help some folks. I believe it will. I believe it will help you. They call it the old-time religion. They call it that salvation. They call it being born again. Saved by the grace of God. Amen. And I'll tell you right now, that, uh, that is still real today. Yes, it is. Nothing has changed. I want you to look at the book of Romans, chapter number 8, with me. The book of Romans, as I've said to you time and again, the reason I keep coming back to it, it's the Magna Carta of the New Testament doctrine of salvation. You've heard people say time and again, well, they took me down the Romans road. That's fine. You can also go down the Ephesians road, and you can go down the Philippians road, all scripture. He said, search the scripture. For in them you think you have eternal life, and there are they that testify of me. And he was talking about Mal uh, Genesis through Malachi. But the word of God witnesses to Christ. And there's a wonderful thing about this. Once you know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not talking about the Holy Ghost and talking about your experience and talking about your church and talking about this and that. You're going to talk about the Lord Jesus Christ. If the Holy Spirit is really residing in your soul, he's going to lift up the Son of God. Amen. That's a sure sign you know him. And a sure sign you don't know him is all you can talk about is an experience. And an experience can be counterfeited. But if you have the real Holy Spirit residing in you tonight, you're going to love the Lord Jesus. And you're going to exalt his holy name. The Bible says there's no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but the Spirit. 1 John 1 says, Then this is the message which we've heard of him, and declare to you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. What this means is that light and darkness do not exist in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ does not lead you through darkness to light. The Lord Jesus leads you out of darkness into himself, and he is the light. He doesn't lead you to a light. If you've been led to a light, you don't know him. The Lord is the light. If you say you see because you've been led to some light or some illumination, you don't know what I'm talking about. You see because you know him. He's your light. And there's no light apart from him. It's all darkness. If we say we have fellowship in, with him and walk in darkness, do not the truth. If we walk in light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, God's son, cleanses, is cleansing constantly, constantly cleansing us from all sin. That means the blood has to exist and the blood must be on the mercy seat and the blood must be in the presence of God. 
Don't ever let some preacher tell you that the blood of Christ is simply a metaphor for his life and sacrifice. No, sir, by his own blood. He said in the book of Hebrews, he entered in one time into the Holy of Holies with his own blood. That blood, folks, is not uh, some abstract theological uh, uh, metaphor of something about what he was and what he did on this earth. It's real blood in the presence of God. And what can wash away my sin? But nothing but the blood of Jesus. But notice carefully and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed into the day of redemption. It's important if you want to walk in the light that you understand the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Godhead, is the energy, power, uh, fellowship that you have with the Father. Yes. The Father's fellowship is through the Son by the Holy Spirit to the Father. Amen. The Greek word over here in Ephesians chapter number 4 verse number 30, it says, Grieve not. Lupeo is the word. And here's what it means. It means to be sad, to cause grief. To be in heaviness, sorrow, be made sorry. In other words, you can get to the place as a Christian where the Holy Spirit inside you feels like he's been to a funeral. Yeah. Sorrowful and heavy. Have you ever noticed how the further you get away from God, the heavier your spirit gets? How you get depressed? I've talked to people, I talk to people all the time. They say, preacher, I'm just so depressed and I'm so defeated. And I just, I've prayed and this was whatever it is, there's something between you and God. Just get on your knees and pray this simple prayer. Lord, put your finger on the problem. And when you point it out to me, give me the grace of God to confess it and turn from it. And that kind of prayer right there can get you with God. The Bible says there's a law of the spirit, there's a law of the flesh, or the law of sin and death. These are two laws. One law trumps the other one. The law of the spirit's a higher law. The law of sin and death is what works in your members. The law of sin and death is connected with the Old Testament law, the Ten Commandments. They're beautiful, but nobody's ever kept them. You can't keep them because it's a declaration of the righteousness of God. And how are we, mortal beings, going to rise up to the righteousness of God? But one man walked this earth 2,000 years ago that kept them. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ. He kept them. Amen. He kept them. Who can convince me of sin, he said. And so nobody could. Verse number 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh to live after the flesh. For if we live after the flesh, we shall die. But if we through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the flesh, ye shall live. Now notice carefully, brethren. And if somebody get the idea, well, I'm born again, I'm sanctified, I don't have to worry about flesh, and I don't have to worry about walking. In the no, 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 no. You have to make a constant choice daily, daily, daily to choose to live for the Lord and walk with God and fellowship with him. So you have to do this in your, own, in your spirit, in your mind. You have to say, Lord, I'm, I, I, want, I, want, I know I believe everything I believed yesterday, but I want fellowship. I want to walk with the Lord. And the spirit is our strength. So he said, if you live after the flesh, you shall die. Have you ever seen Christians die premature deaths? Have you ever seen Christians hit the bottom and die the way they shouldn't have died? You ever seen marriages broke up, two Christians, marriage, bust up, separates? You ever seen that happen? That's sad, but it does happen. Now look at verse number 17. It changes entirely. The Bible said in verse 17 that if we are children... Then heirs and heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. He's talking about suffering. He's talking about a real world and the world we live in. We see people suffer. We see saints go through terrible times. Physically, sickness, sorrow, beaten, locked up, falsely accused. All these things can happen to you. The Apostle Paul said, In all these things we're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Amen. But here's what he said in verse 18, I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed. Amen. 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 Let me tell you where I get strength with the Lord. It is not for God telling me why everything has happened to people, and I have to deal with it all the time. I deal with people who are going through hard times. I can't explain why, but I know who. And that's what makes the difference. The reckon the sufferings of this present time 
What is a little lifespan of 50 years, 60 years, 70 years compared to eternity? We're just a vapor here and we're gone. And he said, it's not worthy. He said, I, I realize it's not easy. I understand that. And God doesn't mock you. He said, cast your care upon him for he careth for you. He's not mocking you. This is why the Lord Jesus came, that he may taste death for every man, that he walked like we walk. Took part of the same, the apostle said in Romans chapter number 8. He likewise took part of the same. Part of it. reason he did is because he can minister the grace we need to live in this world. The older you get, the more you realize this old world's got some surprises. It can, it can, it can, yeah, it does. It's got some stuff it can dump on you. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it does. And I remember when I was a kid, the old timers used to say all the time, well, we never know what's liable to happen to us or what we'll have to go through. I heard that more than once. We'll never know what we'll have to go through in this world. You've heard that. And, of course, that was, that's what you call pragmatism. They, they observed the issue, they, 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 they received it, they understood what it was, and they still chose to live for the Lord. Look at verse number 24. We are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why doth he yet hope for? So what's this talking about saved here? Is this talking about the new birth or is he talking about our life being saved in the sense that our hope in Christ lifts us above the circumstances? That's what he's talking about. He's talking about our hope in the Lord, in the goodness of God. For we know that all things work together for good. For them that love God, for those who are called according to his purpose, right? We know that. Even though we can't understand it, he says right here, our hope. He's not talking about we are saved eternally then we're born again, this is not the salvation he's talking about. He's talking about the salvation of this present life. In plain words, save from its condemnation. Save from its destruction. You rise above whatever circumstances that may drive somebody else down. It's easy to say this down here. It's easy to say these things. And when you've been in it, then you begin to understand what I'm talking about. A sick child, a sick wife, sick husband. Mother and a father. What you have to go through in this world. This is a veil of tears. Notice what this apostle says. Verse number 26. Likewise the spirit itself helpeth our infirmities. For we don't even know what we should pray for. As we ought, right? Now note carefully, this is why I make such a big deal about it. It had nothing to do with your new birth. This has to do with, with you being saved from this life. The Bible says that he's able to save them to the uttermost. To the uttermost, you see, in the book of Hebrews. In plain words, not only are you born again, but you have a high priest. The scripture says we're saved by his life. Well, what do you mean by his life? Because of he's alive at the right hand of the Father, ministering grace to the believers. And I need that. I don't know about you, but I'll tell you right now, sometimes I get down. Sometimes I get depressed. Sometimes I feel defeated. Sometimes I say, Lord, where are you? And the reason he does that, he lets it get dark so dark and dark because when the light is turned on, you'll see it. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You'll see it. So he says in verse number 27, And he that searcheth the hearts knoweth what is the mind of the Spirit, because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Keep in context now. Keep it in context. What's he talking about in verses 24 through 28? He's talking about victory in this life. He's talking about we are saved by hope, our hope. Now, the greatest hope, what is the greatest hope we have? Looking, yes, looking for this blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the second coming of Christ. That's the greatest hope. There's a lot of other hopes, but that's it. I mean, the, folks, listen, let me tell you something. Nothing else will matter if he was to show up right here tonight. You'd forget completely about all your, you know, I got this list I want to talk to God about. Your list will shrink real fast. When the Lord shows up. I got all these questions. They'll be gone. When you see his face, you'll forget all about it. <laughs> yes, you will. I look forward to seeing him. Don't you? First John said, if our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Beloved, if our heart condemn us not, then have we confidence toward God. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. In plain words, he only expects so much out of us. 
That's it, Abraham, I'm dust and ashes, Lord, when he came to intercede for Sodom and Gomorrah, for Lot. He said, I'm just dust and ashes. And he knoweth our frame, the Bible says, that we are but dust. So you only expect so much out of dust, right? This is what we're talking about. The Bible says this, if we deny him, he will deny us. But if we believe not, now listen carefully, if we believe not, he abideth faithful. He cannot deny himself. So what's the difference? The difference is this. To deny him is to, is to actively rebuke or to say no. But to believe not means that your faith is faltering and failing in the midst of all kinds of problems that can come on us. And the Bible says, he abideth faithful. He, let us, and this is what's good. He cannot deny himself. <laughs> Hallelujah to God. <laughs> Amen. He didn't say he cannot deny you. He said he cannot deny himself. We're in Christ. We're sealed with the Holy Ghost. We've been baptized by the Spirit into Christ. And that will not change. Glory to God. The Bible said in verse 29, For whom he did foreknow, this is the foreknowledge of God, who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Go to Ephesians 1 and you get the context of what the Apostle Paul's talking about here. Election is certainly a doctrine in the Bible. No question about it, as I've told you time and time and time and time and time again. The scripture says we're chosen in him before the foundation of the world. But being the chosen in him doesn't exclude others. He said, I have other sheep that's not of this flock. Keep that in mind. Where these five-point Calvinists make, their, make a horrible mistake is by taking a Bible doctrine and then making a blanket application of it over everything. And it doesn't work. It doesn't work. Thanks be unto God, for by the grace of God, he tasted death not only for the elect, but for every man. Amen. Amen. Say, so how do you know you're only the elect? Well, I'll tell you this right now. When you start having God speaking to your soul and the light's coming on inside you and a call goes out to you and you start answering a call, where do you think that came from? No man can come to me except the Father that hath sent me draw him. Amen. What shall we say to these things if God be for us? Who can be against us? Amen. My big brother's bigger than your big brother. <laughs> My father can whoop your father. <laughs> That's what that means. That's exactly what it means. If God is my God, then I don't care about who your God is. God's my God and nobody's bigger than my God. Who, what, if God be for us, who can be against us? It's a rhetorical question. In other words, it's a question that answers the question. By answering the question, it says God's almighty, so there can't be any... Forget it. Nothing. If, I don't care what's come against you. It can't be against you. Because God is greater than all. Revelation 12, 10. I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now has come salvation and strength in the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. He can't stop you from being saved. He'll stop you from growing. If he can't stop you from being saved, he'll stop you from serving the Lord. If he can't stop you from being saved, he'll divert you off into some junk. He, every, he has all kinds of tactics. And, but one, one of the greatest tactics he uses on us is he wires us out with our past. And the longer you live before you get saved, the longer your past. Amen. So I don't have any bones in my closet. You just put one in there. You're a liar. Amen. Amen. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Amen. I don't want anybody opening up my closet. Thanks be unto God for his blood cleanses me. Amen. He forgot it. Cast it as far as the east is from the west. Verse 37 says, Now in all these things, in all of what? The whole eighth chapter. Now in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Not just conquerors. More than conquerors. Through him that loved us. He that hath begun a good work in you. Will perform it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the work. Now he tells you to work out your own salvation. Fear and trembling. Sure there's a part you do. But that has nothing to do with your new birth. That has to do with your life. To work it out. Like I was talking about a moment ago. The, the blessed hope. The hope in the Lord. But he that hath begun a good work in you. Will perform it. This is the sanctification of the believer. This is the, this is the spiritual power pulling you apart from the world. 
I mean, after you've been saved a while, you ought to be, you ought, some of these warts ought to be coming off, amen? <laughs> you ought to be getting some victory over some stuff. I mean, if you've been saved 30 years and you're still a fallen down drunk, there's something wrong, right? Amen. Something's missed somewhere. <laughs> amen. Somebody messed up. And uh, he's, he says in verse 37, and all the things that we are more than conquerors. Praise God. Now, here's why. I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature. In plain words, all creation, whether it be a living thing or a physical thing, height, depth, whatever, none of it can separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For God so loved the world, he loves all the world, he loves all mankind. But if you're born again, he loves his son, and you're in his son. He has a special love for you. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. And not because you're special, but because you're in the special one. He loved his son, and he loves you because you're accepted in the beloved. So it says here, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you have a lack of faith, and we all do, and you have a besetting sin, and you've sworn to God that he'll never bother you again, and then you fall into it again, or you find yourself doing something you ever thought you'd ever do, remember this. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it. It is his, not yours, it is his place to take you from the moment you're born again and to fashion his son in you till Christ be formed in you. And if you won't let him do that, then he may just have to take you home and just take you out of this world. And He can't chasten you and he can't instruct you and he can't deal with you. Lord, let me listen. I mean, don't kick this old mule. You know, kick this old mule. I hope I wake up when you kick this old mule. Amen? I mean, how many times you got to get knocked down before you realize there's something wrong? You got a problem? Yes, we all have problems. We all have besetting sins. We all have weaknesses in the flesh. We all have bones in the closet. We all have lapses of faith. Thanks be unto God. Thanks be unto God. There's nothing, absolutely nothing, that'll keep you from the Father. Nothing, nothing, nothing. Aren't you glad, Lord of God? Hallelujah. I'm, I'm off. I, I'll tell you the truth. I'm... Y'all you know, probably know this, but I'm a very curious person. <laughs> very curious. And sometimes it gets me in trouble. And I'd been doing some research and checking into stuff and looking at stuff and watching this and watching that. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me this afternoon and said, now turn it off, son. That's You've done cross the line. Get out of that. And it came to me just as clearly as I'm talking to you tonight. It spoke to my soul. And I said, you're right, Lord. You're right. And I confessed it right there on the spot. And I said, Lord, somewhere I took a wrong turn. And I'm into stuff I don't need. I don't need this. And God cleansed my heart right then. You've got to be careful when you do research. You've got to be careful. You've got to be careful with it. Some of this stuff out here will you know, grab you. You've got to be careful. And I confessed it. And do you know what happened? I had that light feeling again. <laughs> Just light as it could be. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. Walking on a cloud again. That's walking in light. That's walking in fellowship. Is anybody in this house tonight at that point where you need to confess and you know that you're, 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 you're depressed, defeated, wonder what's happened to your, you, to your walk with God. If there is, why don't you come down here tonight and let's pray. Let's close our eyes. It's quiet in here. The Holy Ghost is in here tonight. It's quiet in here. He's working. Would you like to come down here and let's just pray? Listen, you don't have to confess to me anything. I'm just a man. Talk to the Lord. Just come down here and talk to God. Say, Lord, you've told me, and I'm stubborn, but I confess tonight I need to get out of this. I need to put my attention back where it should have been. Sometimes it's just an innocent, stupid thing, but sometimes it can lead. This always leads into something worse. 
Just tell him tonight. Come and talk to him. Talk to him. Isn't that wonderful? Let us come boldly. That's with assurance. Under the throne of grace. A throne of grace. Not a throne of judgment. Not a throne of power. Not a throne of authority. But a throne of grace. Grace to find. Grace to help in time of need. But you come and confess it to him. Talk to the Lord. Maybe you just need God to help you tonight. Maybe you're your wits end. Maybe you're butting your head against the wall. You don't know what to do now. You've tried everything. That's okay. That's all right. Try until you wear yourself out. God's still God. You're not going to change him. And you're not going to change his love toward you. You're not going to change him. He's immutable. That's a big word. Simply means unchanging. Unchanging. He changes not. He doesn't move with the ebb and flow. He doesn't change over the generations. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the same God today. The God of the Apostle Paul is the same Lord Jesus Christ that he was 2,000 years ago. Nothing's changed. Nothing. Nothing. Father, in thy holy name, I felt your spirit in here tonight, Lord, as I delivered what you put upon my soul. I gave it out tonight to help somebody, Lord. I can get up here and beat people over the head. I have no desire, Father, to get up here and, and bring some kind of a, a false condemnation upon them to feel guilty because I said it. Lord, that's the last thing I want. I don't want them to feel guilty because I said anything. I want them to feel what they feel because the Holy Ghost is moving in their soul. And you've got something good for them. Goodness from God. Goodness. But sometimes, somehow or another, they got sidetracked. Didn't even realize it, maybe at the time. But they're beginning to wake up to the fact that they've drifted. They've drifted. They've drifted away from you. They're not where they were a few weeks, a few months ago. I pray for them tonight. Pray you'd help us, Lord. Call on your name. Because I love you. And I know you love me. And you know you love these dear folk out here. And I know you love the folk that are watching this thing. And will watch it later. I know that. And I know love, I know perfect love casteth out all fear. I know that. And I know the love rejoices in the truth. I know that. In your holy name. Your heads are still bowed. I don't always give an altar call on Wednesday night. You know that. But there's just something in here tonight. There's something in here. There's somebody that needs to move. You need help. Why don't you get it before you go out that back door tonight? Why don't you get help? Why don't you come down here and talk to the Lord? Don't, don't leave here like you came in. You came in tonight because you felt like you needed to be here and you wanted to do the right thing, but you really didn't have any joy in your heart. You really weren't looking forward in, with anticipation for anything spiritual. You're just here. Well, you know what's happening to you, don't you? You're drying up. You're drying up spiritually. You're drying, and that's your life, folks. Your flesh is not your life. Your life is the spirit. Amen. Why don't you come down here and talk to God? Not a preacher. I'm just a preacher. That's all I am, folks. Talk to God. Talk to Him. Talk to Him. Anybody else would like to come down here and talk to the Lord? You know, I've got such a, such a privileged position. You know that? I've been at this a long time, but I never cease to remind myself and remember, here I am up here preaching to people, talking to them about eternity and about their soul and about spiritual things. I'm not building motors and doing brake jobs and laying brick. Not, you know, building houses. There's nothing wrong with all that. That's all fine. That's all good. But I'm talking about souls. I'm up here tonight talking to you about your soul. Anybody else like to come and pray? Come on. It's quiet in here, folks. <laughs> and you all know it too, don't you? You sense it. You sense the Holy Ghost. Yeah, you do. You sense him. Just like this testimony I read where he felt the Holy Spirit come into him. And he knew something had changed. Something profound had happened to him. Sure it did. 
because the Lord God Almighty had moved into him. Anybody else? Father, I've delivered what you put upon my heart. I've delivered my soul. I've given them the word tonight. Bless your holy word. Not my word, but thy word. And Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless your word, anoint it. Heavenly Father, let it go into the person, into the hearts, into the lives of the people. Let it do what you want it to do in their life. Father, give them ears to hear it tonight. Give them a heart that's receptive. And bless them, Father. And so when they walk out of this house tonight, they'll walk out with victory and joy and rejoice in the Lord and be thankful unto God for what he's done for them and remind and remember once again, like David said, Oh, how I would like to have the waters of Bethlehem. In Jesus' name.